It was a dark, wet, foggy night, and two large ships appeared to be on a collision course. The captain of the first large ship, an aircraft carrier, requests the captain of the other ship, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. The reply comes back, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The first captain, a little bit irritated by now, says this is the captain of a US Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. This time, the reply comes back. This is a lighthouse. Your choice. We don't like to give way, do we? Around Ilford, cars are parked on both sides of many of the roads, with a few passing places where people have their driveways. And how often two cars end up facing each other, neither able to get past, because they both try to drive down between the two rows of cars at the same time. Neither driver is willing to wait, nor to back up. And then, of course, other cars stupidly drive up behind both of the cars, and then the horns start blaring. It's quite entertaining from the bedroom window. But the point is, we don't like to give way, do we? We don't like to submit to anyone else. But that will be a problem if we want to follow Jesus. Every day and in every way, Jesus submitted himself to the will of God the Father. And Hebrews 5 verse 7 says that his prayers were heard because of his reverent submission. To follow Jesus, then, means we also learn to submit to God in all things. And we can't say, well, that's different. I'm not going to submit to other people, but I don't mind submitting to the Lord. It's not as simple as that. Well, let's see what we can learn from Jesus. Let's see how we can follow him in reverent submission. First of all, Jesus wanted to submit to the Father's will. Food is something that most of us enjoy most of the time. A baby wakes up because she is hungry and wants to be fed. Children come out of school and before we even get home, they ask, is there anything to eat? Even when we're not feeling that well, we can be tempted with something, even if just a little amount. Most of the time, most days, we enjoy our food, especially on those occasions we cook something special. At all stages of his life on earth, in all situations, indeed, in every way, Jesus had food that he loved. And that food was to do the will of the Father. In the Gospel of John, Jesus sat down by a well whilst his disciples had gone into the town to buy some food. And he had a long conversation with a Samaritan woman. After the disciples get back, they urge Jesus to eat something. And he said to them, I have food that you don't know about. Well, the disciples are, are, are confused. Has, has Jesus hidden a couple of samosas in his pocket? The question they actually ask each other is, who could have given him anything to eat? And so Jesus explains, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. As necessary as it is to eat, so it is necessary for me to do the will of the Father. As enjoyable as it is to eat, so I enjoy submitting my will to the Father in heaven. As much as we look forward to mealtimes, Jesus looked forward to submitting his will to the Father and doing what pleased the Father. It's easy enough for us, of course, to sing the words, I lay it all down again, or take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. But in the classroom, in the office, in the Zoom business call, at the local shop. How do we submit to what the Father wants? Indeed, what does the Father want? It's all right for Jesus to say, I do what I see the Father doing. But what is it that God wants us to do on all of our front lines? 
Well, you know, God wants us simply to be like Christ, to be humble and loyal, honest, reliable, kind and forgiving, helpful, caring, comforting, willing to walk alongside one another. Jesus always loved to do the will of the Father. It was, he said, like eating food. So whether your favourite food is salmon and potatoes or chickpea curry, jerk chicken or go to goosey soup with fufu, what does following Jesus and learning reverence submission look like for you this week? For all of us, it means simply submitting our will to God wherever we go and in all that we do and all we say. Most of us eat food daily. And therefore we are called to follow Jesus and daily submit our wills to God the Father. You'll remember Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that includes my words and my actions and, and my attitudes, the places that I go to and everything that I do. I can't pray for God's will to be done on earth if I'm not prepared to accept the will of God in my life. And therefore, I submit my studies to the Lord and give my best efforts to them. I submit my marriage to the Lord to be the best husband that I can for my wife, or if I'm a woman, the best wife I can be for my husband. If I'm single, I submit that to the Lord also, whether I am content in it or whether I'm disappointed. I submit my retirement years to the Lord, how I can make the best of those for his kingdom in my home, my local community, in my church. I submit my career to the Lord. What does the Lord want? How far does the Lord want me to go? Some of us may have a job that gives us more time in the evening. Some of us may advance in our career and take a job with more managerial responsibility. Neither are wrong. Both can be right as we submit our lives to the Lord. It is good to have time with family. It is also good to have Christians in higher management and in public life, bringing a Christian influence at that level. Let us then offer every part of life to the Lord. This is what Jesus did. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus wanted to submit to the Father's will. Secondly, today, as we begin to focus more on our readings from Hebrews 5 and Matthew 26, it's clear that Jesus went through pain in order to submit to the Father's will. Now, at this point, please don't just sit back and say, well, then that's not for me, because I don't like pain. Nor did Jesus. But he went through it in order to please the Father and for your benefit. Jesus experienced many difficult situations. Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath when he did something to help. Jesus was accused of blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God. Jesus was accused of having a demon when he was setting others free. He was rejected. He was misunderstood. He was tempted. Have you ever noticed how Luke ends his account of, of three such temptations? The devil left him for an opportune time. In other words, the devil was always looking for a good moment at which to try to tempt Jesus. At the end of his life, he was betrayed by one close friend. He was denied by another who said he had never seen Jesus. And he was deserted by the rest of his disciples. Matthew 26 shows us the depth of his pain in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew that Judas was on the way with officials to arrest him. Jesus knew that by nine o'clock the next morning he would be on the cross. Jesus faced the most extreme difficult moments. And so he prayed. Our reading in Hebrews 5 says he offered prayers and requests with tears and cries. The word prayers means speaking to God about a specific need. 
Other examples of the same word in the Bible speak of a prayer that carries a depth of feeling and emotion. For example, in Romans 10, Paul says, my desire and prayer to God. The two really say one thing. His prayer is heartfelt. The second word, requests, is only found here in the Bible, and literally it simply refers to an olive branch. In ancient Greece and Rome, if someone approached a person of power, or if they had a request for the gods in the temples, they would hold out an olive branch in their hand. It showed humility. It expressed their need for help. And Hebrews tells us that these prayers and requests of Jesus were offered with loud cries and tears. And both of those words help us to see what Jesus was going through at many moments in his life, but especially in the Garden of Gethsemane. He tells his disciples that his heart is overwhelmed with sorrow. As he prays, he pleads, Father, if it's possible, let this cup be taken from me. If there was any other way, Jesus would take it. But there wasn't any other way. And so he offered his prayer with cries and tears. Now, was his prayer answered? Yes, it was. Jesus knew all along what the Father's will was, and he submits to it. And in answer to his prayer, he receives strength for all that lay ahead. Well, as we contemplate some of the difficult moments that that we face from time to time, let us be encouraged by this, that Jesus is with us and Jesus understands the tough times that we go through. The end of Hebrews chapter 4 had already told us that Jesus is not unable to sympathise with us. Rather, he knows very well our human weakness and our failings. But here in chapter 5, we read about the pains that he went through and how his prayers were heard through his reverent submission. And now, as our great high priest, he feels for us and stands by in order to strengthen us. And we need that. We need his presence and his strength if we are going to follow him and submit all of our ways to God. Because it will not be easy. If we give way to God and therefore don't swear when everyone else does or won't lie in a business meeting or won't forge an expenses claim or won't join the drinking culture or politely decline the invite to the cinema for an 18 rated film. If we give in to all of life, to what God wants, then it will have consequences. Consequences that may not always be popular, that may hold us back in our career. That may not be easy. I joined one of our home groups online this week and one lady shared something of the pressure that she was under at work. Several people had applied for a job and her boss wanted to appoint someone who had worked for him before. But to avoid criticism, he didn't want to do the interview himself. So he wanted her to do it for him. Now she's a member of our church family. She loves the Lord. She wants to serve the Lord there on her front line. She wants to submit to his will for her in all things. But she knows that the boss has already decided whom he wants to appoint. So what is she to do? What if she does the interview and doesn't think that that person is the best one for the job? You see, doing the right thing was perhaps going to become very difficult. And perhaps you recognise the situation or one that's similar to it. What do we say? What do we do? How do we live righteously in such situations and please our Father? So that evening online, the rest of us prayed for her and, well, we sent her off to do our best. Well, no, we didn't. Well, yes, we did. We prayed for her, but we did more than just say, well, I hope it's okay. We tried to understand the pressure. We tried to think through how to do the right thing. And we tried to share the burden with her. Because like our Lord Jesus Christ, we may find times when it is hard to submit to the will of God. 
and do the right thing. But we are to be encouraged by knowing that our Lord Jesus stands by with us and is there to help us to follow in his footsteps. And so thirdly, let's see that Jesus lived all of life in reverent submission to the Father's will. Matthew and Mark write that Jesus fell to the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke describes Jesus as saying he fell on his knees. But both of those expressions describe what it means to humble ourselves before someone else, what it means to submit to them. Like the soldier who fell on his knees before the prophet Elijah, a mark of respect to the man of God and of submission to his authority. Like Ruth, who had gone to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, how she bowed to the ground when Boaz, the owner of the field, arrived. A mark of humility and of placing herself under his kindness towards her. So Jesus, here in the Garden of Gethsemane, expresses his reverent submission to the Father. One day Jesus had told the crowds that he had not come to do his own thing and please himself, but to do the will of God. I've not come to be served, but to serve, said Jesus, and to give my life as a ransom for many. And now at the end of his life, here in the Garden of Gethsemane, he does in private what he had said in public. On his knees, he once again submits himself to the will and the purpose of God the Father. Now it can be very helpful to kneel when we pray. The physical act of kneeling can help the attitude of our, our hearts. It can help us to humble ourselves and helps prepare us to submit to God's will for us. But you might not be able to kneel physically. That doesn't mean that you can't submit to God's will as God makes it known to you through his word. You can use words to, to help you. In, in your prayer, you can say, Lord, I, I bow my heart to you today. Or Lord, in my thinking, I give way to your will. Help me to know what you want. We see Jesus' reverent submission in kneeling. We hear his reverent submission in the words, not my will, but yours be done. Throughout his life, Jesus had done what he knew the Father wanted. Jesus could say, I do what I see the Father doing. And on the night that he was betrayed, when he prayed for his disciples, he could say, Father, I have brought you glory on earth by doing the work you gave me to do. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus wrestled with the suffering he knew would come next morning. And he completely submitted himself once again to the will of the Father. Not my will, but yours be done. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. No wonder Hebrews 5, 7 says that he was heard because of his reverent submission. It's one word in Greek, eulabia. And eulabia is speaking and acting carefully. Strong's Concordance illustrates it with the example of the way in which we might carry a priceless Persian vase across the room. We would watch every step very, very carefully. When eulabia is applied to the way that we relate to a person. It means that we act carefully in their presence because we recognize who they are. And so we speak with honor, we act with respect, and we submit our will to God. Eulabea is being devoutly submissive. And during his life on earth, this was the way in which Jesus lived. And to follow Jesus is for you and I to do the same. To follow Jesus is to say daily, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. 
So will you say that about your studies, your friendships, what you do with your free time? Will you say not my will, but yours, Lord, in how you spend your money and in what you give? Will you say it about marriage and family and home life? Will you say, Lord, your will about work, about relationships with colleagues and boss and clients? As we have seen today, it may not always be easy. But know that he is faithful. Perhaps you've been wondering about the lady I mentioned in home group a few moments ago, and how did she get on? What did she do when she knew that her boss wanted her to interview and give the job to a certain person? How did she honour the Lord? Hopefully she'll share her testimony next week. No, no, let me tell you. After I messaged her the next day, she texted back and she said, well, Pastor, it went really well. I had a bit of attitude from my boss. Actually, confrontation. And I had to stand my ground on being transparent. But eventually he gave in. So I conducted the interview with another director. God really answered my prayers. And God will answer our prayers as we come before him in reverent submission. In a unique way, Jesus loved to do the Father's work. There are times when we may not find that so easy. Why then should we give way to God? Why then should we live in reverent submission? Simply because that is part of what it means to follow Jesus. He lived in reverent submission. And so therefore should we. May God help us by his spirit.